My name is Joseph Wunderlich, I'm professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science, Elizabethtown College for a couple of decades, was professor at Purdue University before that. Also taught some in Italy at the University of Trento and at the University of Delaware, San Francisco State. IBM research before I went into academia full time and uh, AID Dubai Children's Hospital and robotics. Uh, and then uh, all of the 1980s in uh, building high tech office parks in, uh, in uh, Texas and California uh, for developers mostly, but also working a year in a consulting firm in San Francisco. So we are in an introductory course here. And uh, this is the advanced course, but the introductory course that we are in is uh, here. And we are now down in here, make this a little bigger. And so we've learned, discussed all the fundamentals of uh, computer technologies from transistors on up. Uh, not, not in depth and that there's other courses for that or the gate level design as other courses that teach them that, uh, but basic stuff. And we're building now towards uh, graphics cards and uh, we wanna first look at uh, the physics and technology of waves, analog and digital waves. And then, uh, and then talk about some human vision and then some physics of colors and color and display technologies. I don't think I'll lump them all into one talk, but let's see how we pace through here. So now this, I'm gonna play here a 2020 COVID recording uh, when we went all online, the whole world did. I had resisted doing any kind of recording at all um, or teaching online, resisted quite a bit and rallied other people to resist it. Uh, but then we had no choice. And so now I'm one of everybody who does it. I have a YouTube channel now, close to 300 uh, videos on the, there. They're not all lectures. So we're gonna go into uh, number 20 here. And that's uh, here on YouTube. I'll play it from YouTube. There's PPTX with embedded audio as well as MP4s and PDFs on the college web server. And then uh, I then upload them to, this is the uh, top. Upload them to my uh, YouTube channel. They're all listed in this course as intro high tech lectures. <clears throat> so right here. And uh, we are now down here. Yes. So this will be 30 minutes. I don't think I'll try to pack the other ones in there. Let's see, that'd be 30. So almost 50, let's see, maybe not, maybe yes. This is a introductory lecture on waves uh, with a focus on computing. But first we want to just understand uh, the basic physics of waves and how waves are used in STEM fields other than specifically computing. Uh, my name is Joseph Wunderlich, professor. Firstly, we want to look at just some wave basics. Um, and this particular type of way of looking at a wave is common in uh, general physics, mechanical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, optics. And so uh, you look at wave, uh, here's a, a sine wave. Um, with amplitude on the y-axis and distance on the x-axis. And then the wave has a velocity too that we're concerned with. Um, now all waves have a, a frequency and a wavelength to them. And uh, uh, the frequency is how many times it oscillates. It goes up and down in, per second, given time frame. Uh, that's hertz uh, is the unit of measurement there, abbreviated HZ. Uh, and so this type of wave you see here, uh, its frequency F is equal to the velocity of the wave. It's a, 
vector notation there with a little arrow of the V uh, divided by its wave length, which is the time it takes to oscillate um, completely. Now we want to take a look at. Just notice something that's actually distance on so the mechanical waves there. But usually we're always talking about time on the x axis. The same kind of sine wave, but uh, this time instead of uh, talking about the wave propagating with a velocity, uh, we're talking about time now on the x axis. And this is the more uh, common way of looking at a wave in computer science, computer engineering. Uh, electrical engineering power circuits, you know, alternate, alternating current, which we'll learn about uh, in another lecture. Uh, electrical engineering signals. Um, engineers take a course in signals and systems. We learn all about waves and things in the time domain and the frequency domain. Uh, so in this graph, we see uh, amplitude again on the y-axis, but this time on the x-axis, we have time. And uh, we're talking now uh, about a period or a cycle, not still a wavelength here, but we're mostly concerned about the period or cycle. Uh, in a computer, you talk about a machine instruction cycle or clock cycle um, <clears throat> it's versus time. So here, frequency, again, in hertz is, uh, now we're looking at it as equal to one over the period or one over the cycle of time. For a complete understanding um, of these two ways of looking at waves that we just looked at, uh, all engineers and scientists need to uh, look at both distance and time and amplitude. And now the mathematics that you use, um, <clears throat> Tools, math is a tool. You should like your tools. Uh, is trig trigonometry, uh, trig functions, sine waves, and cosine waves. Um, and we use uh, calculus, uh, uh, including, including partial differential equations and chain rule as a function of time and distance uh, to fully understand waves. Now we want to make it clear about the uh, difference between analog and digital. Uh, digital being what we're going to use in the computer. Uh, but firstly, analog. And analog, uh, most of the world is analog. And so we need to sample that analog world. We need to uh, transduce it in some cases where we have a sensor that's taking analog or uh, detecting analog variables in the environment and making them digital. So we want to understand analog versus digital uh, in computing and in uh, all STEM fields. Uh, dictionary definition is a continuously variable uh, quantity. Uh, no abrupt step changes over time, which is what we see, we'll see in the digital computer. Uh, that step change is a key thing. That's what triggers the events in the computer. We'll get to that. Uh, and the math that you use because of, of the continuous nature of uh, analog waves is uh, uh, integrals and derivatives uh, of uh, function, of trigonometric function. So in the calculus, integrals uh, and derivatives are part of calculus, and the trig function has to do with the, uh, the different waves, sine waves, cosine waves. Some example analog waves of analog waves in the, uh, both the natural world and, and the man made world. Uh, in the natural world, we have ocean swells and sounds. The ocean is, is water, of course. Uh, sound is air, air being compressed and ripples through the air. And the way we hear is the vibrations of, uh, in, our, in our ears of, um, of the parts of our biological system of our sensors. So uh, ocean focuses on distance versus time, velocity, a wave propagating. We've all watched that in the ocean. 
and it has a certain amplitude to it. Um, <clears throat> sound, uh, you can't really see that so well uh, most of the time. Uh, focuses on distance versus time, velocity, and amplitude, which is loudness in this case. Um, <clears throat> there's also frequency too, you know, we could talk about here as sound, uh, the varying frequencies have different properties and how we hear them. Also how sound interacts with matter and certain materials, building materials, uh, have sound transmission coefficients and uh, noise reduction coefficients uh, based on, uh, as a function of frequency as well. Uh, then we talk about some man-made uh, analog waves here. So we have uh, the telephones, old, the old telephone system, uh, and, and then electromagnetic radiation, and electrical power. So firstly, this POTS, it's called plain old telephone signals, becoming somewhat of a footnote because people don't really make much use of this anymore. Uh, but when I was young, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, everybody had a phone into their house, uh, or a phone in their house. They had phone lines into their house, uh, which was called uh, the, the wires in, uh, coming in were copper, uh, uh, twisted pair, they referred to a twisted pair of wires. And the telephone signal uh, the, uh, the, the, that you would hear was propagated on a, uh, a carrier wave that you would modulate with uh, with, this, with the uh, voice. Um, I also, modems were used, we're gonna talk about a little bit with that, uh, to uh, translate uh, these waves into uh, signals used by the computer, with the tones actually, in the olden days. Um, so this, you know, this infrastructure was around for a long time and these were, you know, wires everywhere and switch gear. So the old telephone operators used to plug wires in and out to make connections. Uh, you ever see the old time films uh, there were telephone operators. Uh, and then it became automated with physical relays, switch, switch gear. And it is, some of this still does exist, but uh, now everybody's using cell phones and this is becoming more of a footnote. Uh, and I, actually 30 years ago, uh, you know, when I was doing doctor work and then at IBM, uh, I had two phone lines, wired lines, so I could talk to other researchers um, and programmers in different parts of the country. Uh, at the same time, I was uh, writing part of an operating system and helping develop hardware for supercomputers. Uh, so we do that uh, parts of the country and different parts of the world. Um, we needed these two phone lines, these two wires. So I paid for two separate wired phone lines. Um, are they still, there is still a, a type of broadband called DSL, which uses this twisted pair of wires. Uh, you need to be relatively close, a couple miles from a Peter station for that to work. Um, and now there's also cable communication coming in. Uh, so we'll talk about broadband later. And uh, then next, uh, man-made analog waves, electro, uh, our, uh, we make these, and these are naturally occurring also. Um, you know, light is a naturally occurring electromagnetic wave, um, but we um, create radio waves and uh, you know, we broadcast them and transmit and receive them at certain frequencies um, with a carrier wave that we modulate with the encode with information. So electromagnetic radiation is uh, also distance versus time velocity. It's a propagating wave that's approximately constant because it's uh, you know, going at the speed of light. Uh, you can slow it down a little bit, diffracting it through things. So, so prism you know, works with light, um, but it's essentially the speed of light. Uh, radio focuses on time and amplitude, right? That's the volume of your radio. Turn up the volume, and then light is, uh, you know, all, all the same properties of the wavelength, but we focus more on the of, of the wave, same properties of the wave with with light as other you know, forms of electromagnetic radiation. Although we speak mostly of the wavelength, for example, when we talk about visible light, we see within a narrow band of wavelengths and frequencies uh, because of our sun 
that our Earth orbits around, and our eyes have adapted to that. And light is an interesting phenomenon, how we see it. Um, there are people who are colorblind, animals see things differently. And so our brains actually are uh, interpreting those wavelengths in different ways, which is not necessarily constant. There's a general uh, average way that all humans do, but then there's uh, you know, deviations from that with people in color blind and animals see things differently. So that's the way our brain actually sees light and the colors we see, the colors we see and how we differentiate is a, I'm gonna say a trick, but it's somewhat of a, you know, it's an adaptation of how our biological um, processing interprets and differentiates color. We'll have a whole lecture on color. Uh, now, electrical power, um, now that's, you know, of course, there is lightning, which is natural, but for the most part, we're going to focus on man-made power in this course. So focus on, and, and we're going to focus on time and amplitude. Um, and so we'll see that uh, the voltage, you know, whether it's 120 or 240 in other countries, you know, or five volts or three and a half volts for the circuits um, that we uh, that we have in computers, or 12 volts for disk drives and uh, fans in the computers, is is uh, that's the amplitude of electrical power wave, and then phase shifts, which is really beyond what we want to talk about in this course, um, voltage lagging or leading to current, and so uh, that's. That's more for uh, engineers and electrical engineering courses and electrical engineers as a profession. Uh, you talk about single phase versus three phase power. Uh, and what you do there is your sine wave, you have three of them on the same uh, carrier lines um, coming in, um, separate wires, but the, uh, the, and uh, but then they combine together in the machinery uh, that they, uh, presumably uh, uh, driving, for, for example, electrical three-phase motors, where each one of these phases that are slightly shifted apart uh, correlate to a different position of the motor rotation. So you can imagine the peak of each of the waves pulling the rotor around in a circle. Yes. So we understand analog a little more. Now we want to understand digital. So our computers are digital devices, so digits being zeros or ones. And so we take the natural world and we sample it, we transduce it, we get it into the computers, and then we want to uh, do things digitally. So the definition of digital is uh, using numbers, especially binary numbers for input, processing, transmission, storage, or display, rather than a continuous spectrum of values like analog, uh, or, or non-numeric symbols such as letters or icons. Okay. Now, the abrupt changes are a key thing. Uh, abrupt changes, steps over time. And um, we're gonna see in a second uh, how that's used in the computer, and uh, later on, more detail in other courses, certainly quite a bit more. It's an introductory lecture, introductory course. So um, the mathematics now are summation, so sigma. If you ever see time series, uh, you'll see that in other courses if you continue in electrical engineering kind of things, mathematics, uh, a time series. So that's different than uh, calculus with differentiation and integration. We're talking about summations here and, uh, and time series. Here is the most important aspect of waves for computing applications. Uh, the digital wave example um, in a computer, your clock, your clocks, various clocks uh, have a, a square wave like you see here, a voltage versus time, where you have a leading rising edge and a uh, vertically, and then a trailing uh, falling edge vertically. 
of the clock pulse. And um, you want to think of those edges as triggering events, triggering events in the computer. So for example, uh, in, in the computer circuits, changes between machine states, the uh, finite state machine that we learn about in other advanced courses that is in the control unit of the CPUs, of the cores, the processors, that uh, is a function of the clocks and that drives the pipeline stages and how things are sequenced. Uh, each of those changes of state are uh, triggered by clock edges. And uh, also another example is your reads and writes from memory cells. And so when you uh, put an address on the address line and wait for that signal to stabilize and then you, you're uh, say for example, reading from memory, and then uh, once that signal and address line stabilized and you're pointing at something in RAM, the CPU is pointing at something in RAM, uh, then you have this uh, clock edge that comes along and says, bang, go, uh, retrieve it. And that, uh, that's how that works. Uh, another example is the opening routing pathways for data. Learn about this in other courses, the multiplexers that route uh, different information and the data path, the CPU, uh, for example, things coming from registers into the ALU, arithmetic logic unit. And then uh, once you do some computation uh, logically or arithmetically with those uh, values, that data, then routing it again somewhere else, all that happens on the edges of clocks into those events. Now that we understand analog and digital signals and waves, um, <clears throat> we want to talk about going between the two. Uh, the modem traditionally long ago was for your twisted pair of copper lines coming into your house or your office and uh, converting at the time was uh, tones, sounds, uh, uh, encoded sounds uh, in analog coming across the twisted pair wires and that would be translated into uh, to digital. So now uh, you're modulating and demodulating. That's where modem came from, converting between the communication signals. Uh, now we have uh, other kinds of modems, uh, cable modem for the coaxial cable that comes into our house, and, uh, connects to our computers. And then uh, another conversion thing here that you'll see, uh, microcontrollers have them in them, other kinds of devices, programmable logic controllers, PLCs, uh, uh, meant to interface with the physical world and control manufacturing systems and infrastructure, and sophisticated controls, aerospace and other places. Uh, the ADC means analog to digital converter, and the DAC means digital to analog converter for allowing digital computers to control the most, uh, mostly analog physical systems of the natural world. Now we want to speak about some wave limits uh, and how they apply to technology in general. Um, the speed of sound in dry air, uh, remember you do need air for sound to travel, uh, or water, you need some kind of medium. Uh, sound does not travel through space, a vacuum. Uh, and uh, Mach 1, you speak of speeds of aircraft and uh, space ships. Uh, in terms of Mach, so uh, 775 miles per hour, you may have heard, it's Mach 1, break the sound barrier at that uh, level of the plane's going uh, that fast. You have sonic boom, where the sound waves emanating from the engines, um, the, the, the aircraft actually catches up to the speed of the uh, 
or the emanating waves and compresses them until there's a sonic boom as it passes through uh, mock, each mock level. And so in metric, which you should get used to in all things scientific, is 345 meters per second. And we want to compare that now to the speed of light, right? Uh, all, electric, all electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, and, um, in a vacuum is uh, uh, approximately three point uh, or you know, three times ten to the eighth meters per second. Uh, and then also an important note here: people speak of light years, and they say, "Well, it took light years to do." Well, that's not correct. Light year, a light year is a distance, not a unit of time. A light year is a distance, not a unit of time, and it's the distance light travels in one year. Uh, and then this is important too, I think, because it explains why uh, there's lags or there's a difference between sometimes what you see and what you hear, like when lightning strikes and then you have to count so many seconds, you see the flash and then you hear the sound uh, a little bit later. It's, it's based on this. And also just understanding the difference between the acoustics of uh, what's coming out of your speakers and music versus uh, versus the transmission of communication signals wirelessly. So you know, the question here is how much faster is light than sound? The answer is, well, you know, since uh, 345 meters per second equals 3.45 times 10 to the two, right? You move the decimal point over to the left two, that means you got to raise to the power of two and the 10 to keep the same number. And then we just divide our speed of light divided by our speed of sound, and we get approximately 10 to the sixth, which is, which is a million um, times faster, six zeros. Um, also important to know that electricity is going approximately the speed of light. You say, well, it's a third. Well, yeah, but the speed of light is so fast that you know when you're going a third, you're still going compared to everything else that we think of uh, the approximate speed of light, really. But we say third speed of light. And then uh, finally some trivia here. Uh, my first course that I ever taught was uh, when I was a physics grad student in 1988. And I taught astronomy and physics. So we talk about space travel and how far you know, things are probability of being able to get there in any kind of reasonable amount of time. And so uh, you can look these up on your own. This is not homework, it's just for fun, but you know, how fast is our fastest, fastest spaceship? And there's some multiple of Mach, of course, you know, we're not going to speed of light or anywhere near that. Uh, how far away is the closest solar system? Well, it's a couple light years, maybe two, four. So think about that. Going at the speed of light, if we could go anywhere near there, that speed, which we can't. And then how long would it take our fastest ship to get there? You're gonna see it's not much longer than you might realize. Uh, however, how long would it take uh, radio and TV broadcast to get there? Well, that's a little more likely because that is going the speed of light. So you think about when we started broadcasting into, uh, into the air, uh, mid, 20th century. And so how many years has it been since then? And think about how fast things travel at the speed of light. And so, you know, what radius, the radius around the earth, how far out could there be people possibly hearing us? And then of course, if they did, they'd have to broadcast back and then, you know, we'd have to wait a period of time to hear them. So you know, cut that time in half if you want to actually hear back from, you know, the, the distance and half that radius, if you want to, I guess, if we could possibly be hearing back from anybody at this point. And so we broadcast all different frequencies and the way we, you know, we do it even early on with radio signals is we um, broadcast into the air, you know, out towards space on these radio antennas. And then it, uh, it, it uh, bounces uh, off of the ionosphere and then people can hear it in other places. 
other than the people who are in direct, direct line of sight with the antennas, then you don't have to wait for the bounce. Um, and now we have, you know, cell phone repeater towers, and, uh, and you can bounce off the of satellites also, um, right? So um, this is something to think about there. And, you know, to give you a, a, a hint, we're not likely we're going out of the solar system. You know, it takes a couple of years just to get uh, to Mars, and then even longer to get to the moons of Jupiter, where there might be some life under the ocean, frozen ocean on one of the moons. Uh, Europa, but going to another solar system, you'll see it's just out of the question in a spacecraft at the speeds that anywhere, you know, even if we double, triple the speeds of how fast we can go in space now, it's still not feasible, you'll see. However, there is a chance with radio waves that we could uh, listen and hear. And there's a whole project called SETI, S-E-T-I, you can look up to see that uh, we've been doing that for a while. Uh, with supercomputers now analyzing all different uh, frequencies and trying to look for intelligent coded information on the carrier waves, different frequencies. But that's just for fun, if you would like. Hmm. This is a lack. Um, let me add a little bit here. So at the this right, is a at the right end here that we could. Uh, uh, so, you know, astronomy and space travel and aerospace is more than just a passing uh, interest of mine. So, uh, uh, you know, I taught astronomy in 1988. But before that, I, uh, my father this worked on Apollo missions and, other, and uh, defense contracts in the 50s and 60s. Um, this is an Apollo rocket you see behind me. Um, let me just show you his thing here real quick. Listen in here. Uh, go to my personal site here. And this is my father's site. I'm speaking and I made this for him. And he, he died uh, 14 years ago. <laughs> uh, but he, he was in World War II uh, and then as a, as a soldier, an infantryman, uh, he didn't want to go in the army, he wanted to go in the Air Force, his father, wouldn't sign the uh, enlistment papers when he was 17. This is middle of World War II. So on his 18th birthday, he got drafted into the war, spent two years in the trenches in the Philippines. Uh, didn't have a, a bad job. I mean, he had to go out and do lots of warlike things, which he had PTSD kind of memories from. But he tested genius level when he did, did his army uh, uh, test. So they made him the clerk for an entire company even though he was only 18. So he kept track of all the, the weaponry and uh, which he said was sad near the end of the war because nobody actually wanted to fill out the paperwork. So they were just driving Jeeps into the ocean just so they wouldn't have to fill out the paperwork. And then he came back and he was on um, the GI Bill, went to University of Houston, uh, was uh, an engineer there and then joined the Texas Air National Guard. Almost went to Korea uh, with that. And then he spent 25 years uh, before he became a, a, a teacher and professor uh, of physics and um, calculus in uh, high school and college. He had 25 years in the aerospace industry, including working on aerospace stuff and, and supervising up to 90 uh, employees on big contracts and doing stuff in the Pentagon and all that. Um, so yeah, it's more than just a passing interest for me in uh, in aerospace. Now, the, the lecture you just heard, the context of that. Um, oops. This is a introductory. That start playing. Um, in here, in computer engineering, um, this course uh, was a required course for all computer engineers for, for the first 20 something years I was here. And uh, now it's going to be an elective. All this, the new computer engineering uh, option within the engineering program allows for an elective. So hopefully most of the students will take, uh, computer engineers will take this. Um, and, and that's a foundation for a lot of other things. So we talked about analog and digital circuits in there and clock edges. You have to know that kind of thing before you can understand sequential circuits, design, digital design, you know, things changing in time. Uh, in digital design one and two. 
uh, as well as interfacing signals. Um, <clears throat> And uh, also, the, my teacher's robotics machine intelligence class, some version of it in, in Italy here. I just want to show this real quick. So this was I taught it here. And this is a big, it was a PhD course, actually. Uh, I taught about the solar system and uh, space. And this Europa project was a joint venture between uh, NASA and the European Space Agency uh, that was, looked like it was really going to work. And actually, and ironically enough, Russia too was involved with that uh, during that time. And, and you know, they will be again. Um, we're going through the little bit of a tension here with the Ukraine, but um, it's, I don't want to put this on the recording, but if you were around with the Crimean Peninsula, I was actually in Europe at the time and flew around Europe and to London and back and Italy and back to Belgium. Um, my uncle worked for NATO there for 30 years for in models for I mean, he died 10 years ago, but he worked on, on classified things for NATO shape, uh, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers, Europe, and Mons. And, you know, uh, it, it, it was bad. The economy was problematic. Everybody worried. And then, you know, it settled down and it uh, didn't escalate. And so let's assume that's going to happen here, too. And most all probably will. Okay, I didn't mean to put that in recording, but it is. All right, so let's uh, stop sharing. Um, anybody want to ask questions about any of that on the recording? Count to 10, 10, 9, 8. That's enough. I'll stop and then you can ask questions. Also. <clears throat> 